everyone, it's Mrs. Kendall, and this is the first lecture for Unit 4, Developmental Psychology. I did a live Class Connect this morning, and I don't know why, but it didn't record. And if you go in and try to take, click on the link, it actually takes you to something I did on writing for American History yesterday. Um, so don't know what happened. Class Connect kind of tripped out on me. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and record this for you guys. Um, we have this lecture and then I have another one scheduled on Thursday because this unit's pretty big. So I split this first section up into two different lectures. So developmental psychology, what are we talking about when we're talking about this? And this is pretty much the study of you from the womb to the tomb. So from conception until death, we're going to study how we change physically, socially, cognitively, and that's our mental capabilities, our thinking, and morally over our lifetimes. So this unit is going to focus on the physical and then, or I'm sorry, this lecture. And then the lecture on Thursday, we'll look at social, cognitive, and moral. So from the very beginning until the end. Okay, so when we study developmental psychology, we do two types of studies. The first is cross-sectional studies. So what we'll do in a cross-sectional is we'll be looking at like brain development and maybe the prefrontal cortex. And we'll look at the prefrontal cortex in five-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 25 year olds and 35 year olds so we'll look at different ages at the same time the other study that we do is longitudinal studies and this is where we study the same group of people the exact same individuals at different points of development so we'll start with newborns and we'll study them now. What does their prefrontal cortex look like? And then when they're in kindergarten, we'll pull those same kids in and look at their prefrontal cortex. And then maybe when they're in fifth grade and 10th grade. So we're studying them over the long haul. That's how you can remember that long. So long term, the same group of people. Okay, so stages of development, what we're going to go through. We're gonna talk about prenatal, and that's zygote to birth. We're gonna talk about childhood, and there's four stages of childhood. So infancy, which is up to 12 months, young childhood or toddlerhood, which is one to three, and sometimes you'll see this as one to five. Middle childhood is 4 to 12 or sometimes 6 to 12. And then adolescence, which is the lovely stage that you are all in right now. And adolescence can actually last into the early 20s, especially for males. And we'll talk about that. And then we're going to talk about adulthood. Young adulthood, 20 to 39. Middle adulthood, 40 to 59. And this actually used to be pretty much where it ended. 100 years ago, most people didn't live past 60 um, or 65. But now we have advanced adulthood, which is 60 until death. And a lot of people are living comfortably into their 70s, 80s, and 90s. So from zygote all the way on up, okay? So just some interesting statistics that I pulled for you. For every thousand babies born, 50 more are male. So more boys are born than girls. More babies are born in August. Um, we had a fluke year in 2010 when more babies were born in September. More babies are born on a Tuesday. Sundays are the day where the least number of babies are born. And the most common birth date is October 5th, and the least common birth date is October 22nd. So I know someone in the live lecture this morning was born on a Tuesday in August. So just an example, um, I don't fit any of these statistics. I was born on a Saturday in November. 
So, okay, prenatal development. This is everything up till birth. Okay, so walking you through this, and hopefully you've learned this in a biology or a health class, but the ovary releases an egg, and women are born with all of their eggs when at the very beginning, and that's the most eggs they'll ever have. Men make sperm from puberty, and that slows down with age. So this is why it's harder for older couples to have a baby. As soon as one sperm penetrates the egg surface, it blocks out all the other sperms. Egg and sperm nuclei fuse, and that's a fertilized egg, and that's called a zygote. You will need to know this vocabulary. So a zygote is from conception until about two weeks. And this is a really interesting statistic. Fewer than half of zygotes survive past the first two weeks. So nature takes care of that. And half the time, the zygote doesn't survive. 10 days after fertilization, the zygote attaches to the uterine wall. As soon as it attaches to the wall in the uterus and the inner cells become the embryo, that's about two to eight weeks. So if you hear people refer to a baby in the womb as an embryo, you can now correct them and say, oh, that's only weeks two to eight. So then we have the fetus and fetus is nine weeks to birth. The next six weeks, organs begin to function and form. The heart begins to beat. By nine weeks, the embryo is what we call a fetus. By six months, survival is possible if born prematurely because the organs have developed enough to make it possible. But there's a note here. Girls develop faster than boys. So if it's a boy and it's looking like a premature birth, they will do everything they can to hold it off because the boy is not as developed as a girl would be. They don't worry as much when it's a girl that's going to be born early because usually the, the organ that they're waiting on the most is the lungs. And if the lungs aren't developed, then the baby will have a harder time surviving outside of the womb. So keep that in mind and you're going to hear that over and over. And boys, I'm not, I'm not making a dig on you. It's not anything of my personal beliefs. It's just a biological fact. Okay, so development. At each stage, genetic and environmental factors affect development. The placenta, formed from the zygote's outer cells, attaches to the uterine wall, and the placenta is what transfers nutrients and oxygen to the fetus. The placenta is also supposed to screen out potentially hazardous agents, and it does a really great job, but sometimes they get through. And just so you know, this is a typo. There's a missing letter here. It's teratogens. And sometimes those harmful materials called teratogens get through. So if we're looking at development, this is the number of weeks across the top. So weeks of development and kind of what the baby looks like the fetus, the embryo, and then you can see each of the development periods. And the dark purple is when they're developing the most. So teratogens in the first two weeks, if you look here at the bottom, they're going to say prenatal death. If there's a lot of teratogen exposure in the first two weeks, it is pretty likely that the zygote won't survive or even later, depending on where it is in the two weeks. Weeks three through eight, they're saying major morphological abnormalities, and that's physical deformation. So things not being formed correctly, eyes not forming, ears not forming, um, there was a story going around on Facebook, and I don't know if you guys have seen it, but there was a young lady who was born without legs, and she went on to become a gymnast, and then found out she was related to a famous gymnast. It's a really cool video, and I'll try to remember to share that with you guys. 
Um, and then later, weeks 8 through 38, functional defects. So something doesn't function correctly and minor morphological abnormalities. And you can see when things are developing. So the heart is done being developed by the eighth week of development. So if a teratogen comes in in the 38th week, it's not going to affect the heart. It could affect the central nervous system, the eyes, the teeth, and external genitalia. So this is a really cool chart that breaks down teratogens and what impact they might have. So let's talk about teratogens, and there's a lot of them. Um, chemical agents that can harm the prenatal environment. Probably the leading teratogen is alcohol and that's called fetal alcohol syndrome. Alcohol enters the bloodstream and depresses the activity of both the central nervous system of the mom and the fetus or the embryo, depending on the stage. Common symptoms or signs of fetal alcohol syndrome are small head, the flat mid face, the low bridge, between the eyes, the nasal bridge, small eye openings, a short nose, a thin upper lip, underdeveloped jaw, okay? Teratogens also don't have to be chemicals. Here's another example. Sexually transmitted diseases can harm a baby. HIV, you know a baby can be born with HIV. Herpes, genital warts, and syphilis can also harm a baby. So, what is the specific impact of teratogens on the mind? So, when we're talking about it, how do chemicals affect brain development? And this is a pretty um, interesting video, and it's going to talk about radiation, nuclear radiation, and alcohol specifically. the fertilized egg. In this single embattled cell lie the roots of a human mind. Within hours of its fertilization, the cell begins to divide and divide again and again. Gradually, that first cell becomes a ball of hundreds of cells. They seem identical, but hidden within them is a chemical blueprint that controls what they will become. In response to some preset biological signal, the ball folds in on itself. Cells begin to assume roles, some as muscles and bone, some as heart and liver, some as part of the nervous system. A tube begins to form, the first step in the development of the brain. As the tube grows, a layer of cells appears. It's organized into neurons, which form the basis for all functions of the brain and glial cells, which nourish the neurons and help them migrate to their destinations. They orchestrate a pattern of development that will emerge in the first stirrings of the human mind. By the eighth week, the structure of the brain has begun to emerge. On the right, a glial cell, the glue of the brain. On the left, a neuron, the future information processor. The glial cell is sending out its fibers to find the neuron a dance that begins a major milestone in brain development. The entire process is programmed by genes, but it is susceptible to changes in the environment. The interaction of neurons and glial cells represents a critical period of development. This is a time when the brain is most vulnerable. Teratogens, agents such as chemicals and viruses, can reach the embryo or fetus and cause harm. 
Recently, attention is turned toward just what those teratogens are and what kind of potentially damaging effects they exert on the brain and mind. April 26, 1986. The nuclear reactor at Chernobyl in the Soviet Union suffers a disastrous meltdown. Ten months later, scientists estimated that mental retardation among fetuses exposed to the radiation could be five times as common as in the general population. They based their estimates on the results of a catastrophe that had taken place more than 40 years before. The bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki not only killed hundreds of thousands of people, they irradiated countless vulnerable fetuses in critical periods of development. In the wake of the bombs, clues began to emerge as to just how radiation might affect the exquisite choreography of growing brain cells. Well, the story about radiation-related brain damage actually began here shortly after the bombing. We soon recognized that children who had been exposed in utero, a small number of them, were severely retarded. The earlier analyses of the data uh, tended to focus on a conventional division of the gestational period into trimesters. We divided the gestational period into four intervals of time, which correspond to more or less separable periods of development of the brain. Once this was done, it became very clear that 80 uh, percent large measure, all of the cases of mental retardation, occurred to women who were in a specific stage of their pregnancy. That is, the fetus was between 8 and 16 weeks following conception. Now, we know from neurobiological evidence that that period is extremely critical because two fundamental events are occurring. First, neurons continue to proliferate at the astonishing rate of 250,000 per minute. Second, the glial cells have formed a web of fibers, and the neurons actually crawl along the web to their final destinations. For fetuses in Hiroshima, radiation interrupted that journey. Neurons have a specific date of birth, and they'll have a specific destination. And they do not migrate haphazardly. They have an address and they move to that address in a highly choreographed sequence of events. And since we know that brain function critically follows brain position, cells have to be in the right place to do the right thing, even though alive, even though in the general area, they don't perform the proper function if they're not in the proper site. Their crucial journey disrupted the migrating neurons probably stop short of their intended destinations. These events have devastating repercussions for people whose mothers were exposed to high levels of radiation at a critical time in fetal development. The birth and migration of neurons, two critical periods that are profoundly affected by radiation. But do other environmental insults also interfere with brain development? In 1751, William Hogarth etched Gin Lane, a portrait of despair. Among its horrors, a mother pouring liquor into a baby. Remarkably, science only began to recognize alcohol's effects on the fetus a few years ago. Fetal alcohol syndrome was discovered by a resident in our Department of Pediatrics in 1970. Christy Euland was doing a study of infants who were small for gestational age, infants who were born on term but were little. And among those children, she found a few children who looked alike, who were very small, who were all retarded, and whose mothers all had a history of, of heavy alcohol use. Although the report met with skepticism, others confirmed that alcohol affected both body and brain. But what of the effect on the emerging mind? In Gothenburg, Sweden, Marita Aronson studied babies with fetal alcohol syndrome. She found that alcohol could cause damage in very subtle ways. Many of these children have um, problems. They have uh, hyperactivity, they are, have impulsiveness, they have temper tantrums, they have short memory span, they have perceptual disorders. 
These shapes were copied by two children the same age, one normal, one with fetal alcohol syndrome. And here, a child with the syndrome who tried to draw a human figure simply couldn't stop drawing noses and eyes, a sign of damage to the frontal lobe of the brain. <laughs> the behavioral effects of alcohol range from the most subtle to the most severe. But what does it actually do to the brain? In the 1970s, Sterling Claren came up on a clue. At that time, we had the opportunity to study the first autopsy case of an infant with fetal alcohol syndrome. And we were able to get the first real visual and graphic evidence of how devastating this condition could be to the human brain. Uh, this is a picture of that first brain compared to a normal human infant brain. The first thing that's obvious is that the brain is very small. But there's more wrong with this brain than that. You can see that the gyri, which are the normal brain squiggles, are really rather flat and thick. This is a cross-section of a normal infant brain. These are the size of the ventricles, the holes in the center of the brain. And you can see how thick the white matter is and how the gyri kind of form convolutions around the brain. This is the exact same section of that brain of a child with fetal alcohol syndrome. You don't have to be a neuropathologist to see that every single part of that brain is malformed. The holes in the center are way too big because there's so little white matter to fill them in. The brain density is really reduced, and that normal convolutional pattern of the brain has been lost. We get a clue to understanding how this kind of a malformation could come about by looking at the tissue microscopically. This is a section of the cortex of the cerebrum. The normal surface of this brain is in fact here. And then there's the stuff that's covering the brain that looks like it's in fact erupting through the cortex. This is in fact a malformation. It's a hodgepodge of all the different cell lines, all the different brain elements that go into creating the brain. It's as if the cells of the brain, when they were migrating to their final homes, didn't know when to stop and continued right on through and erupted onto the surface through little bridges like these and just came up onto the surface and became scrambled. These kinds of, of heterotopias or cell groups that are in the wrong places are typical of fetal alcohol syndrome and would suggest that alcohol dramatically interferes with cell migrations early uh, in brain development. Alcohol and radiation are just two examples of teratogens. When present during critical periods of development, they can adversely affect the brain. Both kill newly emerging brain cells. During cell migration, alcohol causes neurons to continue growing past their destinations. Radiation stops them short of their target. Both interfere with the crucial timing of development. After migration, the process of development continues. Around the 18th week, the brain begins to stabilize itself. At 21 weeks, the auditory cortex begins to function. At 26 weeks, the visual cortex links up. Witness this microcosm of normal brain development. These three neurons are sending out fibers trying to form a network of cells. At the end of each fiber is a growth cone, a tiny fluttering tip that depends on chemical signals to find its way. Normally, the brain produces far more neurons than it actually needs. Sometimes they succeed in linking up, sometimes they fail. For these three neurons, the process is simple. One of them dies. The other two form a connection. The scene repeated countless times in the developing brain leads to a network of neurons of incredible complexity. The evolution from a single fertilized egg is complete. Okay, so that went really specifically, but it also showed you brain development, and I wanted you to see that fetal alcohol syndrome in particular um 
Physical and cognitive abnormalities in children caused by pregnant women's heavy drinking. And I want to be really specific in that we know it's not a woman having three beers over the course of her pregnancy. We know that it's more like alcoholism. It's heavy drinking. Um, severe cases, the symptoms include facial disproportions. And you can see this, that broad nasal the short flat nose, the thin upper lip, the flattened cheeks. So you can see that in this little boy. So let me show you some of the things that are teratogens that we don't often think about. There, if you have watched a woman and really watched a woman go through pregnancy or, you know, a close friend or maybe even yourself, you know that there are a ton of things that you can't have that a lot of people just take for granted. And so let's take a guess, Tylenol. Can pregnant women have Tylenol? The answer is no. Okay, so they have a headache. What's their next choice? Aspirin. Can pregnant women have aspirin? No, they can't. Okay, so let's say it's not just a headache, she has a cold. NyQuil, no. Benadryl. Um, there's a ton of medications that just cannot be taken. Um, here's one in our culture, caffeine, our Starbucks rush, um, our Starbucks addiction, whatever you want to call it. Um, not really. Um, they can have caffeine from time to time. Moderation is key. Um, and oddly enough, one thing that will often help a headache is caffeine. So... Sometimes some of my friends, when they've been pregnant, their doctors have been like, have a cup of coffee instead of a Tylenol or an aspirin. Here's another one we don't think about, sushi, fish. They can't have that either um, because of mercury levels um, that appear in fish. Most prescription drugs, and you can actually, there are websites that you can search um, the names of medications and they classify them from A to D. So A is safe. B is we're pretty sure that there's no problems here. C is iffy and D is really shouldn't do it. Um, and there are some cases where they have to decide whether to take the mom off of a medication or not. If it's controlling a life-threatening disorder, then it has to be weighed. It is Does the benefit outweigh the risk? Um, and of course, alcohol and illegal drugs. And, and alcohol is an interesting one. Doctors are kind of towing the line. Some doctors are still saying no, 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 none ever. And some doctors are starting to say, you know what? An occasional glass of wine is probably not an issue. If you're drinking a bottle of wine, that's probably an issue. Um, I have a lot of friends who have just said, nope, not going to risk it. You know, they just won't even think about it. Okay, so development. We're focusing on physical development. And it says this week because this was a slide I forgot to correct. So for each stage and then actually the, and we'll be specifically looking at the nervous system. So physical development. This focuses on our physical change over time. So from a baby to a grown, what I am assuming someone who's benefited from, you know, a few steroids here and there, but how we change over time. Infant reflexes. This is one of my favorite videos. I love showing this. Um, I can explain them all and I'm going to very briefly, but you're going to see them all in the video. So we have the rooting. So if you rub a baby's cheek with your finger a couple of times, their head will automatically turn that direction and it's for breastfeeding purposes. Babies are born with these automatic reflexes or responses, sucking, grasping, this is not coming up in order. Okay, so grasping. So that's why babies, you give them your fingers and they just hold on for dear life. Stepping. And they're going to show you that in the video. It's not stepping like you're thinking of. Well, kind of, but not really. 
blinking reflexes like blink. the palmer grass and then there's stepping, moro or moro startle and babinski it's both are names. an inborn um, and you'll response. see this in the video nature's tool and babinski to planter to adapt to the and world. you'll see this in the video Many as well reflexes, so let me go ahead breathing, and show you this swallowing and sucking for example have survival value other more primitive reflexes like the moro and grasping are considered leftovers from our evolutionary heritage Survival reflexes usually become voluntary at some point during the first year, while the primitive reflexes disappear. <laughs> Anthony, go back down for a second. So, so pretty much losing that. So should we draw us the, the toe goes up and fans out? Just like that. Some reflexes are predominantly related to the nourishment of the infant. Here, in response to stroking at the corner of Aiden's mouth, we see the rooting reflex. One week old Aiden turns his head and opens his mouth. He roots in the direction of the stroking. This helps the infant find the breast or bottle and begin feeding. Sucking is another reflex that helps the infant find food. Aiden will instinctively suck on any object that is placed in his mouth, including the doctor's finger. Some reflexes are predominantly related to the protection of the infant. Stroking the palm of Mackenzie's hand will cause her to close her hands and fingers in a grasp. The grasping reflex may be so strong that the baby can support her own weight. The moro or startle reflex is seen when support for the head and neck is suddenly lost or in response to a loud noise or sudden movement. Here, one-week-old Aiden throws his arms out and back in response to the doctor's sudden drop of his hands. The moro reflex, which should be fully present at birth, begins to disappear at around five months of age. Jessapina, who is just two months old, has already begun to lose the moro reflex. Absence of the moro reflex at birth or reappearance after the normal age of disappearance, approximately five months, may suggest damage to the central nervous system. So she doesn't have a startle anymore. It's gone. Okay. She's, she's matured and she's overriding that. Some reflexes, such as the stepping reflex, are related to postural control. When held upright with her feet just touching a flat surface, two-and-a-half-week-old Olivia appears to take steps and walk. This reflex, which typically disappears at around two to three months of age, will not be seen again until Olivia learns to walk on her own. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. I'll do, let's do that a little better. Let me hold you this way so people can see you. And there, like that. She starts taking some steps. And you can get it to if you sort of touch the top of her foot. So pick up a little bit there, like that. Reflexes are also used to identify normal brain activity. Absence, persistence beyond the normal time for disappearance, or the reappearance of a reflex later in life is suggestive of significant neurological problems. For example, the Babinski reflex, exhibited here by Olivia when the bottom of her foot is stroked, causes the big toe to flex towards the top of the foot and the other toes to fan out. The Babinski is normal in children under two years of age. After two years of age, the presence of the Babinski indicates damage to the nerve paths connecting the spinal cord and the brain. Okay, so kind of cool to see those reflexes actually working. And, you know, you can back up this recording and watch them again. Moro startle, you need to know. Babinski planter, you need to know. Um, the stepping, that it they have it at first when you hold them up. They'll kind of move their feet like they're walking. But then it goes away and we don't see it again until they go to walk. So these are instant infant reflexes that they are born with. 
Okay, so what are their sensory capabilities? In a newborn, what senses do they have? We know that touch is vital for emotional development, and we're going to talk about that later in this unit, but babies who aren't touched, um, we see significant developmental delays with them, um, even cognitive, their thinking skills. So they have a high sensitivity to touch to touch when they're born. It's already highly developed. They're highly sensitive to pain. And we believe, or psychologists believe, or the psychological you know, body believes that physical touch actually releases endorphins, which is the feel good um, neurotransmitter. Um, so touch there is pr very well developed. Taste and smell, we know that they have basic taste, and we know that through their facial expressions. Um, they have some odor preference at birth, and if you believe in this particular idea, um, a lot of psychologists believe it was for survival skills evolutionarily. Narrowly. Hearing, they prefer complex sounds, um, not just a simple tone. They want to hear noises and voices and music. They can discriminate between sounds. They know the difference between a man's voice and a woman's voice. And we know through watching language development that they're starting to acquire a language, even if it's babble. And vision is the least developed. Their visual structures are not fully formed yet, and they can't focus their eyes. Okay, so toddlerhood. We change more in toddlerhood than we do any other period in our lives. And in this, these first two years of life, our height increases by 50% of what it was at birth to one year and 75% more by two years. The weight quadruples in two years. Baby fat, the cute little pudge, like on that little guy there, um, peaks at about nine months, and then it starts to go away. It slims down as, as they become toddlers. They're not very muscular. Strength and coordination are limited. Girls are shorter and lighter at birth, and this continues until adolescence. You'll hear them talk about skeletal age, and that's the measurement of bone development. So if you've ever watched one of those TV shows where they try to determine what age a skeleton was, they're looking at skeletal age. And there's changes in body proportions as well. So brain development. At birth, the brain is nearly adult size. That's why babies' heads are so big in comparison to the rest of their body. Um, and it's one of the few organs that is nearly adult size or adult size. But it's still developing on a microscopic level, the brain cells and in the cerebral cortex itself. So prenatal period, neural development. Neurons are being produced and migrate to different parts of the brain. This is prenatal. Once they're in place, they differentiate and extend their fibers to form those synaptic connections. During the first two years of life, the synapses increase at an astounding rate. And we know that stimulation, the more that you use the neurons, the more likely the neurons are to survive. So stimulation is necessary. If the neurons aren't used, if they aren't stimulated, then they die off. Um, so the first two years are vital to development. Um, neurons that are seldom stimulated lose their synapses, and that's called synaptic pruning. Some of this goes on naturally. There's stuff that we don't need, and our brain just prunes it away. And glial cells reproduce or multiply dramatically, and they're involved or responsible for myelination. And that's creation of the myelin sheath. And guys, I'm, I'm going to say this once, and I'm going to say it probably a hundred more times, but your final is going to cover this whole class. So if you're not sure what the myelin sheath is, I suggest you pause the video right now Go back to chapter two, unit two, and look at the parts of a neuron because the myelin sheath is really important for how the neurons function. Okay, 
So the cerebral cortex, this is what most of us think of is as the brain. 85% um, of the brain's weight, it surrounds the whole brain. Most neurons and synapses are here, and it's the last brain structure that stops growing. So it grows for the longest period of time. The order which regions grow corresponds to what infants and toddlers are learning how to do. So as their vision improves, the regions of the cerebral cortex associated with vision are growing. The frontal lobes have the longest period of development. And just so you guys are aware, the frontal lobe is not fully developed until between the ages of 18 and 25. So that's going to be important later. That will come back up and we will talk about that. Lateralization, so what each hemisphere does, that's what that's called. And then brain plasticity, and this is really an amazing topic, but basically, as a child, your brain is what is called plastic. If a part of your brain stops working, another part of your brain will start doing that part's job. There's actually a really cool YouTube video YouTube video out there of a little girl who they had to do a hemispherectomy which means they had to take out half of her brain. They had to take out one whole hemisphere due to seizures. And because she was so young and because of brain plasticity, the other half of her brain learned to do everything. Um, super cool video. Okay, so sensitive periods of brain development. We know that early, early on, extreme sensory deprivation, depriving a child of sensory information, results in permanent brain damage and loss of function. So this proves to us that there are sensitive periods of brain development. We have to have visual experiences to develop the brain's visual centers. If a baby is deprived of light, the damage can be severe and permanent. And obviously, these are not things that we do deliberately. We don't take a child out of a normal child-rearing environment and put them in a dark basement. Um, so we rely on case studies. Um, we look at orphanage, orphanages and kids in orphanages. And there's two really interesting cases. Um, one was a boy in England who... Um, was raised without any human contact whatsoever and truly like basically raised in the wild. Um, and then there was a girl here in the United States and I believe it was California um, that her parents put her in the basement pretty much from the time that she was born until probably seven or eight, nine years of age when they were caught and it was found. And so we can study those cases and we know that it has a huge impact on kids. Bottom line, we must be stimulated in order for our brains to develop properly. So what things influence physical growth? Heredity, your genetics. Um, if your genes say that you're not going to be seven foot tall, you're not going to be seven foot tall. Nutrition. And specifically malnutrition, and this is a really sad statistic, but this is one third of the world's kids. Um, it's a diet low in almost all essential nutrients. And some of the problems that come about because of malnutrition can become overcome, but some of them remain, especially in regards to learning and behavior. So this is why schools have school lunch programs and school breakfast programs and all of those things because we know it affects learning and behavior and then emotional well-being and this is called non-organic failure to thrive so not an organic cause not a life cause not a biological cause um, physical growth can be affected by lack of love so babies not picked up babies not held babies not showed a affection we know that those things can actually impact physical growth. Okay, so early childhood, two to six. And like I said, sometimes this number varies. But this is the play years. The body growth slows down. The baby fat starts to melt away. Girls keep a little bit more of that than boys. 
posture and balance improve. There's motor coordination, meaning they can do things like catch a ball. Um, I've got two nieces, one is four and one is seven. And of course I've watched them grow and always while I was teaching psychology. So I was able to see these differences in them. And I can tell you, you know, a year ago we were playing with one of the big balls that you see at the grocery store or Walmart or Target or wherever. And the older one was getting to the point where she could see it coming and catch it. But the younger one, it always bounced off her belly and she giggled. Um, because she didn't have that motor coordination yet. Um, we start to notice individual differences, skeletal changes, um, cartilage hardening um, into bone, and you start to lose your baby teeth. And that, that age varies, and we, we think that that's genetic factors. Okay, so early childhood, two to six, what's going on in the brain? The brain increases from 70% of adult weight to 90% of adult weight. The cerebral cortex has overproduced synapses. Rapid growth in the frontal lobe from three to six, and especially with planning and organizing. And you'll see this if you sit down with a three-year-old and you six, sit down with a six-year-old, the six-year-old will be better at planning and organizing things. And the three-year-old is probably still doing whatever they want with no planning, um, sorting, you know, by color or by whatever system they have. Um, the left cerebral hemisphere is especially active and that's important. Um, they gain in tasks that depend on the frontal cortex, inhibiting impulses and substituting thoughtful responses. So they start thinking about what they're doing and not just having an impulse and doing it. Language skills are increasing at an astonishing pace. And if you've been around a three to six year old, you know this. Every word you say, they learn. Even the words that you shouldn't say. Um, and they're learning a ridiculous amount of words per day. Um, it's thousands and thousands. It's crazy. And that's, of course, in the left hemisphere. So they're developing mostly the left hemisphere. Other brain developments, they're starting to link parts of the brain. The link between the cerebellum, which is balance and body control, and the cerebral cortex grows and myelinates. So they have more motor coordination and it supports thinking. This is the peak of production of the synapses and the myelination of the corpus callosum. And we see motor skills develop and there's gross motor skills and fine motor skills. And you will need to know the difference. So gross motor skills um, are their general body movements, smooth and rhythmic movements. They can leave the, the ground. They can jump up and down. It's the big stuff, the athletic stuff. And then the fine motor skills is control of the hands and fingers. So they're able to draw. We can see them start to, to write and print letters because they have more control over their hands and fingers. Okay, middle childhood. The body continues to slowly gain size, about two to three inches per year, about five pounds a year. And this is when we hear of growing pains because the muscles are adapting to a larger skeleton. And maybe a lot of you have experienced that. Um, all 20 baby teeth are replaced by adult teeth. Girls overtake boys in physical size. And bones continue to lengthen and broaden, so they get longer and wider. Motor development. They become, in this age group, more flexible, more balanced, more agile, and force, their, their strength. All of these reflect gains. They're more efficient at information processing. They can take information, do something with it. Reaction time improves. Fine motor skills still get better. Writing becomes legible, we hope. Drawing increases in organization, detail, and representation of depth. So a tree is closer than a house. Girls are ahead in fine motor skills. Boys are ahead in gross motor skills. Um, 
these kids start to play games with rules. Um, and they stick to those rules. And if you break those rules, they let you know. And boys go through that rough and tumble stage. And then there's adolescence. And this can be viewed as storm and stress, teenage angst. Um, some say this is exaggerated, that being a teenager is not as tough as, you know, it's made out to be. Um, but what we do know through studying this is that there's a lot of variation. Um, and we think it has to do with environment. Um, depending on the environment you're in can make adolescence harder or easier. And we also know that the demands and pressures vary between cultures. So I just threw up some things here. Ignore what's in the middle. But, um, you know, some things about being a teenager and you can go on Google Images and find millions of these things. So, you know, the one in the bottom left, you breathe and your mom says, I'm so sick and tired of your attitude. Um, this one's one of my favorites. You come in and you say, I got an A in chemistry. And mom says, WTF, well done. And you look at your mom and you're like, what do you think WTF means? And mom says, well, that's fantastic because there's a disconnect between the generations. Um, my parents say it's their house, but when it's time to clean, it magically becomes my house too. So adolescence, by definition, this is 11 to 18, although some psychologists have begun to stretch that because as mentioned earlier, boys develop slower. So adolescence for young men often lasts until early 20s. So this is the transition between childhood and adulthood, storm and stress. Freud actually called it a developmental disturbance, which almost implies that there's no development, which is not correct. Um, exaggerated, and as I said, varies from person to person and culture to culture. Um, I love this anatomy of a teenager's brain. Um, the birds and the bees lobe is way up front and it's huge. And then you've got stuff like um, this tiny little area down here at the bottom, memory for chores, homework, etc. And then at the back, all the answers and that space is pretty big. So you can kind of look at that. It's kind of funny. Um, and it almost plays to the stereotypes of what people think that teenagers are. Um, you know, center of the universe, rebellion, fitting in, um, indestructibility. We know this. Um, we've studied this. Teenagers really, because the frontal lobe is not fully developed, don't fully understand consequences. And therefore, they do things that appear to show that they feel they're indestructible. And not all teenagers. Okay, puberty, the fun stuff. Period of sexual maturation during which a person becomes capable of reproducing. That is the technical definition. The good news is you're about to be attracted to girls. The bad news is you're going to be covered in pimples. Okay, so... So, okay, kind of a, a funny one. Sixth grader Kyle Kipperman didn't get much playing time. Look at him, he's skinny and scrawny, although he is kind of tall. Then he went through spontaneous puberty and look at him, now he looks like a man. Okay, hormonal changes. There's secretion of the growth hormone, GH, and thyroxine. These are both hormones in the endocrine system, and they result in tremendous gains in body size and attainment, so finally, skeletal maturity. And this starts about age or eight or nine. Um, estrogen and androgens. Um, testosterone, for example, is an androgen. These are hormones that are affecting things in the body. Testosterone affects muscle growth, facial hair, and other sexual characteristics. Estrogen is maturity of sex organs, feminine proportions, menstruation. 
adrenal androgens in girls is the height, growth spurt, underarm, and pubic hair. I want you guys to understand that we often hear that testosterone is a male hormone and estrogen is a female hormone, but we all have both. So all women have testosterone and estrogen and all men have te testosterone and estrogen. And estrogen in both equals growth hormone secretion and that equals growth spurts and gains in bone density. So when they say that being a teenager is a hormonal storm, it kind of is. Your hormones are in overdrive. So what goes on body growth wise? You get a growth spurt both height and weight. Girls, this starts around age 10. Boys, this starts around age 12 and a half. Girls are done by 16. So to the girls out there listening, if you are 16, 17, 18 years of age and you want to grow another three inches, I'm sorry, it's probably not going to happen. Boys, you've got till 17 and a half. Um, during puberty, you're going to grow 10 to 11 inches and you're going to gain 50 to 75 pounds. Um, unfortunately, and I don't know whose cruel joke this was, hands, feet, and legs grow first and then the torso. So that explains that middle school awkward stage. Boys' shoulders broaden and girls' hips broaden and both sexes gain muscle. Um, here's my Bieber joke because puberty is funny. I'm going to have to replace that in the next year or so with somebody else, but for right now it works. Sexual maturation. You need to understand this. This is something I'm telling you you're going to see primary versus secondary sexual characteristics. Um, we have, we all have sexual characteristics, but primary sexual characteristics are those involved in reproduction itself. So the uterus is a primary sexual characteristic. Okay. Pubic hair, not. You don't need it to reproduce. Secondary are visual and show development, but they're not directly related to production, reproduction. So breast development, that's secondary. You don't need them to reproduce. Um, but they do still develop. Sexual maturation takes about four years. So for girls, it starts with the first period, um, which is called menarche. And that happens between 10 and a half and 15 and a half. And we'll talk about um, what causes that earlier late in a minute. And then spermarche first ejaculation. I don't know how they came up with an exact age, but the average is 13 and a half. It doesn't seem to have a range. Okay, so this breaks it down for each gender when things happen. So age in years, and you can see girls are almost all the way done by 16 and a half, but you look at boys, it's all the way over to 18. And you can see all of the changes on each side and the peak and the growth spurt. So I can guarantee you, if you're a boy and you get a pair of shoes when you turn 12, they will not fit you when you turn 13 because that's the peak of your growth spurt. Okay, so I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to look at that. Okay, so secondary sexual characteristics, as I mentioned, these are not related to reproduction. So widening of the hips, deeper voice, breast development, which I didn't give you a picture, sorry, and body hair. Those are secondary sexual characteristics because they're not needed for reproduction. Although some would argue that the widening of the hips is for the baby to pass through the birth canal but it doesn't actually make reproduction happen. It happens to be convenient. Okay, so differences in puberty. Why do we see differences in puberty? Why is it at different ages? We know that it's heredity, heredity your genetics. Um, we know that nutrition has something to do with it. So when we see malnutrition, menarche is greatly delayed. 
exercise um, can have a really big impact. If someone is an athlete, puberty tends to slow down. Socioeconomic status. And this is literally what it sounds like, how rich or poor a family is. The higher the socioeconomic status, the earlier menarche happens compared to low socioeconomic status. And there are some um, correlations there, but remember, correlation is not causation, but one of the correlations is possibly nutrition or um, physical affection, um, parental attention. There are some of those things that they kind of look at. You know, if mom's working three jobs, does that impact how much love and affection and attention a child is getting? Um, early childhood safety and security. And then there's this secular trend. This, this is really odd and it's going on right now and it's a generational change. And what is being documented and this is being studied like crazy is that in industrialized nations like the United States, the age of menarche, that first period, is decreasing by three to four months per decade. And they don't know why. Um, they're looking maybe at some stuff that's in foods. They're looking at society. They're looking at all sorts of things to try to explain it. But it is happening, and it's been going on for five or six decades. Okay, so the teenage brain. Um, and I am going to have to put the link onto this one um, because I don't think I can get it to play from here, and I don't have a way of recording it. Um, but this really talks about what it's like to be a teenager and what that experience is. Um, someone wrote in to um, these two guys, and one of them you'll recognize. He's actually um, on The Office, so if you watch that show. Um, but they talk about a lot of what goes on with the teenage brain. And, I mean, even down to bullying and... Um, you know, how, you know, it is to be a teenager. And I, and I guess the big takeaway from it, and I'll summarize it for you if you don't want to go watch it, but the big takeaway is that you have all the same emotions that adults have, but you have them at a greater intensity. So you feel things and you experience things and you have to experience things a hundred times what an adult does. So it makes everything really extreme. So when you're sad, when, and this is kind of where that drama queen thing comes from with teenage girls, it seems worse. Um, in the video, the one guy talks about how when his first girlfriend dumped him, he slept in his closet for two weeks. Normal adults won't do that, but teenagers will. Um, and that's okay. That's part of the experience. It's almost like you have to go through this. Um, and just remember that you do come through it. And there are adults on the other side standing here telling you that you do get through it. And I know that there were times when I was a teenager where I thought it was the end of the world and everything was to extremes. And I never slept in my closet for two weeks, I'll tell you that, but um, you do get through it. And, you know, adults, I know you don't want to trust them, but we've been there and we remember. So trust us and, and find an adult that you trust that you can talk to and whoever that is um, to help you uh, kind of handle the extremes. So what's going on in your brain during brain development. And some would say that that's an oxymoron. I disagree, but there's lots of pruning in the cerebral cortex and the frontal lobe. So your brain is figuring out what you need and you don't need, and it's getting rid of the stuff you don't need. Um, so this is why it's really important for you to stay in school right now, because your brain's going to get rid of anything you're not using. So use it or lose it. Um, there's growth and myelination of stimulated neural fibers. So you're strengthening the connections that are already there. There are enormous cognitive advances 
you can start to think about things in logical and rational ways that an eight-year-old cannot. Neurons become more responsive to excitatory transmitters. So we think that this is why teenagers react more strongly to stressful events and experience pleasure more intensely. Everything's a hundred times, and we think that this is why. There's alterations in the neurotransmitter activity, making teens more susceptible to certain disorders like depression. And we know that there's a change in the brain's regulation of sleep, perhaps because the brain is so busy developing, you know, kind of the final touches. Um, teenagers need more sleep. We know that. Um, we covered this in the last chapter. Um, there was a recent study saying that teenagers literally cannot fall asleep, many of them, before 10 or 11 o'clock at night. So one of your assignments in the last chapter was to look at schools that are starting later and what impact is that having on learning. Um, I, for one, do not understand why there are still high schools starting at 7.20 in the morning. I don't understand. Um, because it goes against everything we know about the teenage brain. I'm going to skip that, that one slide. I'm skipping it. Okay, so psychological impact of puberty. Puberty has a psychological impact. It's a mixture of positive and negative emotions. Girls know now about menarche, but some still don't know. And I have to tell you, I had a friend who didn't know. No one ever talked to her about getting her first period. And I was the lucky contestant that got to be with her when that happened. And she was freaked out. Um, she had no idea what was going on. But usually girls know. Boys get even less, less support. Sper Spermarchy no one sits down and talks to boys about that. And that's really a shame because they should, because believe it or not, it often happens and the boy has no idea what's going on with them. And they don't know who to talk to about that. And it's scary. Um, some cultures do have an initiation ceremony. Um, many of you are Hispanic. So quinceañeras, um, the Jewish faith, and I'm blinking on it, bar mitzvah, that's what it is. Um, but Western cultures, American culture, little formal recognition. Deep valleys and high peaks in regards to emotions. And younger adolescents are even less stable. So ages 12 to 16, less stable. Early and late maturing experiences make more difficulties. So that's what's great about this type of lesson is you're not having to respond to me or anyone else in the room, but you know if you were an early bloomer or a late bloomer, how difficult that was. Um, and if you have friends that have had that experience, try to be empathetic because they will wonder what is wrong with them. Um, I had a good friend who developed her breast long before everybody else. And I remember her thinking she was weird. And of course, I'm her friend, so I had repercussions to it. We also see a rise in child-parent conflicts. Well, duh. I mean, we all know this about teenagers. You fight with your parents. Um, for those psychologists who believe in the evolutionary perspective, they think that this happens for a reason, that you're going to move on and away from your parents. So this is psychological distancing. You're preparing for it. Um, there are other theories. Um, some have to do with the hormones, the intensity, all of that type of stuff. And parent-daughter relationships or conflicts seem to be even more intense. And one of the questions that's being asked is that because there are more restrictions on girls than boys. Okay, adulthood, three stages, early adulthood, middle adulthood, and late adulthood. This makes fun of it by saying there's four, there's red adult, I can do whatever I want, no parents, partying it up. Sad adult, I wish I could do whatever I wanted. You've settled into your life. You've gotten married. You have babies. Your life isn't your own. And you can't do whatever you want anymore. And then you go to mad adult, and that's that angry old man saying, kids today just think they can do whatever they want. 
and then dead alt. This is not what I wanted. Um, so let's talk about adulthood. The truth is, and I promise you, you may not believe me right now, but five or 10 years from now, you will agree with this. You will be the people posting on Facebook that you no longer want to be an adult and you want to climb into your blanket fort in the living room and be coloring because adulthood is overrated. Don't grow up any sooner than you have to. Early adulthood. Senescence begins. This is biological aging. So wrinkles, your body starts deteriorating. You're going backwards. Um, gradual physical changes that accelerate later in adulthood. There's a decline in heart and lung performance. Look, you will never ever be the runner that you were under the age of 18 because there's going to be a natural decline. Athletic skills peak in the 20s, and it varies depending on which skill we're talking about. Immune response declines after 20. Shrinking thalamus and stress. So your immune system's really strong as a teenager. So if you're getting sick as a teenager, um, you know, that's why sometimes they'll look for autoimmune disorders because it's not usual. Teenagers are pretty good at not getting sick. But once you get over 20, trust me. After 35, women's reproductive capacity declines due to the fact that she has fewer eggs. Every single menstruation, she's getting rid of an egg. So after 35, it's much harder to get pregnant because there's less eggs. Vision, hearing, and skeletal declines throughout the 30s and 40s. Hair begins to get gray and get thin. Um... And boys, I'll give you the hint right now, whether you're going to be bald or not, look at your biological mother's father. That's your answer. And I hope I didn't crush anyone's dreams. Um, and girls, that's true of you too. If your mother's father went bald, you will have thinner hair as you get older. Um, most likely you will not lose it all, although cases of feminine baldness do happen. Gray hairs, some of you may already have them. You may not know you have them, but your hair begins to gray in your 30s and 40s. And trust me, when you find the first one, you'll freak out. Um, sexual activity declines, and they don't think that this is anything physical. They just think it's demands of life. You have a house, you have bills, you have a job, you have kids. You don't have time for it. Um, and you don't make it a priority because getting food on the kitchen table for your kids is more important. Physical development, middle adulthood. We start presbyopia. This is the loss of accommodative ability of the lens of the eye. So reduced ability to see in dim light, increased sensitivity to glare. I can tell you this is the first symptom I'm getting. I hate driving at night. Because the glare, or on a rainy night, especially the glare off of the street of the headlights, really bothers me. I'm more sensitive to it. Diminish color discrimination. So being able to tell the difference between two shades of blue. Risk of glaucoma. And glaucoma is a pressure buildup that damages the op optive nerve. And it can actually make you go blind later in life. Hearing. Presbycusis. Detection of high frequency and then other tones. I actually already put this on um, the announcements under YouTube links. Um, there is actually a mosquito buzz tone that adults cannot hear that you can hear. And I know for a long time it was kind of a fad to make that your ringtone. Um, because then you could hear it like at school in a brick and mortar school and the teachers couldn't hear it. And they thought they were very funny. Um, so you can actually go hear that. I put that video up for you guys. Skin loosens and wrinkles and we get age spots and muscle mass declines and fat deposits increase. None of this is fun stuff. This is not anything any of you are looking forward to. I know it. Bone density declines, especially in women after menopause, which is why they start talking about osteoporosis, and that's where bones become brittle and break very easily. And then climacteric, 
Um, this is a 10 year period in women where estrogen drops and that ends actually in menopause. So the end of that 10 year period is menopause where they stop having periods. Okay, late adulthood. So now we're talking after 60. Loss of neurons, T slash O means throughout the cerebral cortex. The greatest loss is in the frontal lobe and the corpus callosum. This is why some elderly people make bad decisions. Um, there was just a case, I live in the Prescott area, and there was just a case here where um, an old, older couple was scammed out of like $10,000. Um, and we hear of cases like that all the time, and they're really sad because they really, they're losing some of their judgment, their ability to look at a situation and determine if it's a good decision. The cerebellum also loses neurons. The brain does compensate some by forming some new synapses and generating, to some extent, some new neurons. The autonomic nervous system functions less well. Um, cataracts and macular degeneration, hearing impairments, impaired speech, taste and odor sensitivity decline. And I always help people remember this by thinking if you ever go to an adult care facility or what we used to call nursing homes and go into the dining room around dinner, you're going to see two things. You're going to see first, they eat things that you and I would never touch. And second, you're going to see them pour on salt and pepper. And that's to give it flavor. Um, I remember I volunteered in a nursing home and like they had liver three nights a week and I won't touch it. I wouldn't touch it as a teenager. I still won't touch it as an adult, but they don't have as much sensitivity. So they'll eat more stuff and touch sensitivity declines, especially in the fingertips. Cardiovascular and respiratory declines are more evident the immune system functions much more not effectively. Um, so that's why they always tell seniors to get their pneumonia shots and get their um, flu shots because their immune system just can't handle it. And because the cardiovascular and respiratory systems aren't as strong, if they get sick, it can be much more serious. And here is the cruelest irony of life. Okay, so you turn 65, you retire, you don't have to work anymore. Your kids are grown up and out of the house and you have all this time on your hands. And all of us automatically think, oh my gosh, I have all that time. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to sleep 12, 16 hours a day, man. I'm just going to sleep. And you can't. As you get older, you need less sleep. So in late adulthood, over 60, it's harder to fall asleep. It's harder to stay asleep and it's harder to sleep deeply. So now when you have the time to sleep, you won't be able to. Nifty, huh? Okay, other adulthood changes. Um, vocational period is in early adulthood. This is when you're in college or you're trying to figure out what you're gonna do with your life. You'll start out with this fantasy um, and then you'll settle some of you will for something more realistic. Um, I wanted to be a veterinarian, but I'm not really good at math. So um, I focused on history and psychology. Um, and it wasn't settling. I love what I do and I still study psychology. So dementia is forgetting. Alzheimer's is the most common form. Um, and we're actually making some progress with Alzheimer's. So there's been some great news. Um, some of you may have experienced a loved one um, who has Alzheimer's or know someone who's been through it. It starts with memory problems and then we see personality changes. And most likely it's anger and it's because they, they kind of know that they're forgetting stuff. Um, and then depression, and then eventually loss of ability to form and comprehend speech, and eventually death. There is no cure for Alzheimer's as of right now, but I can tell you that I believe it was 
two weeks, a month ago, something like that, um, they actually reverse Alzheimer's in a mouse in a lab somewhere. So that was fantastic news. We have age-related limitations on working memory. So working memory is our short-term memory, if you remember that. Um, it has less impact on implicit memory. And if you're not remembering these things, this is a good cue to go back and review. Remote memory is not clearer than recent memory. They do better on event-based rather than time-based perspective memory. And I put a mad face here. It totally had to do with AP Psych, so I'm just going to skip it. Um, wisdom. Extensive practical knowledge. Um, adults have more wisdom. And you get it with age, and you only get it through experience. And wisdom comes from being able to look back on something and reflect on it and apply that knowledge. So wisdom when you're young is touching the hot burner and then thinking, gosh, I should never do that again. You now have the wisdom. So by the time you're 60 years old, you have a lot of wisdom. You've had a lot of life experience. And if you haven't taken the time to sit down with grandparents or great grandparents, please do because they have so much that they can teach you. And I know you feel like they're boring old stories, but if you actually engage in it, they're sharing life lessons with you and they love to do it. Um, they become altruistic, meaning they become more charitable. They become more giving. They want to share what they have to offer. Um, we know that staying mentally active can help you maintain your cognitive abilities. There is study after study after study after study. People who do the daily crossword puzzle hold on to their cognitive abilities much longer than people who don't. So Sudoku, there's even apps on your phone um, that you can download that help you every day stay mentally active. And we know that health, nutrition, and fitness make significant differences. People that stay healthy through their lifetimes, work out, eat well, take care of themselves, will do better later on in life. Okay, so physical milestones, menopause for women, is really the only one we have. And this is the seven menopausal dwarfs. Itchy, one I'm not going to say. Sweaty, bloaty, sleepy, forgetful, and psycho. Okay, so that's the end of lecture one. The password that you're going to send me for watching this via K-mail so I can keep track of who's actually watching the lectures Remember, you either need to be watching the lectures or doing the reading. Um, you're going to send me the word change because development is change. So if you want to get credit for watching this lecture, go ahead and send that to me. And make sure that you are checking out the links that I put in the announcements, both under recordings and under YouTube. Lots of great stuff there. And then next time we'll get into moral, cognitive, those types of development and that's when we'll get into some philosophers and psychologists that you're you're maybe you've heard of before okay guys thanks so much and let me know if you have any questions or concerns schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me remember i'm here to help good night <laughs>